I think I can start with the introduction um, and um, so that we also have give some time for our viewers to join uh, on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is Svetlana Borodina. I am a, a postdoctoral fellow at the Herman Institute, and I'm so excited to have you join us today for our second talk uh, of the work of care um, in Russia lecture series. This year's series explores how Soviet and post-Soviet Russian care workers have been sustaining lives and why sometimes their efforts hurt rather than heal. Today is our second event in the series. And before we begin, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the logistics of the event and uh, give a few thanks. Um, as usual, we are running this event as uh, a webinar. So the audience can uh, watch or tune in on Zoom uh, or on YouTube uh, where we're streaming live. Please don't hesitate to ask uh, any questions. You can do so on Zoom uh, if you type your question into the Q&A feature or on YouTube if you type your questions uh, into the chat. Once our speaker finishes her presentation, I'll pose them uh, to her during our Q&A session. And of course, thanks to the Harriman Institute and uh, the Russian Studies Workshop at Indiana University for the support of the series. And uh, as usual, special thanks to Carly Jackson for helping us organize and run the events uh, smoothly and with no problem. And uh, we're really uh, honored and privileged to have Dr. Tatiana Chudakova participate in the series and give a talk today. Dr. Chudakova is assistant professor of anthropology at Tufts University. She is a medical anthropologist whose interests also include science and technology, environment, indigeneity, and nationalism in the context of Russia and North Asia. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2013. And in 2021, a few months ago, her first book, Mixing Medicines, Ecologies of Care in Buddhist Siberia, was published by Fordham University Press. The book uh, is based in Buretia, a traditional Buddhist region on the border of Russia and Mongolia, and it's known for its post-Soviet revival of Tibetan medicine and shamanism. The book traces the uneven terrains of encounter between indigenous healing, the state, and transnational medical flows. Part of this research uh, also appeared in academic journals, including Medical Anthropology Quarterly, American Ethnologist, Comparative Studies in Society, and History, among others. Today, uh, we will hear a presentation titled Mixing Medicines on Shifting Terrains, the Politics of Integrative Care in Clinical Spaces in Russia. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chudakova. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much, Svetlana, for inviting me. Um, it's really, and thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to um, be giving this talk at the Harriman Institute. And um, okay, so without further ado, first of all, I will have a kind of um, PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is just to kind of distract you from my face, but it also kind of give you, give, will give you a sense of um, um, the locale that I'm talking about. Um, and then please feel free to, if anything is unclear, please feel free to uh, drop questions in the chat and I hope we have a chance to, um, you know, to talk um, afterwards and I get a chance to answer your questions. So without further ado. In post-socialist Buryatia, an ethnic minority region of the Russian Federation located on the border with Mongolia and where mixing medicine is set, the Russian state's relationship with indigenous and minority therapeutics has been inconsistent. Over the last three decades, it has toggled between enthusiastic endorsement, strategic indifference, attempts at formal regulation, and outright criminalization. Alternatively formulated as an aid to a beleaguered healthcare infrastructure or as questionable treatments <clears throat> excuse me, of last resort, therapeutic practices labeled traditional are caught in a bind. They are at once overburdened with the task of redressing the country's public health crisis and themselves frequently blamed for perceived national illnesses. Based on 20 months of ethnographic fieldwork carried out in Buryatia between 2006 and 2017, the book is an ethnography of therapeutic life at the peripheries of the state. It asks what it means for certain forms of care to occupy a space at the cusp of uncertainty in the marginalia of patients' quests for therapy, where the very existence of a culturally marked therapeutic approach is at once validated, commercialized, and disavowed. 
I argue that debates over traditional medicine in Buryati encapsulate broader questions, such as those of the relationship between Russia and Siberian indigenous minorities, about whose histories count in post-socialist times and about what constitutes both medical work and working medicines. In sum, traditional medicine is a contested terrain used by both the Russian state and the local Buryat population to articulate novel futures and ways of life. In 2006, Russia's federal government launched a nationwide initiative entitled Zdarogya, or Health. It was one of four national priority projects aimed at increasing, in the words of Vladimir Putin, the population's quality of life. Zdarovia targeted the healthcare system nationwide and was meant to improve Russia's health through lifestyle education, financing the modernization of medical equipment, and expanding the availability of primary care. But its fourth pillar was to revive a commitment to preventative and rehabilitative medicine. And this latter emphasis promoted new forms of care rooted in the integration of both traditional and folk medicine, citing the non-invasiveness of plant-based therapies and suggesting that traditional medicines were well suited for addressing the systemic chronic dysfunctions that plagued the nation. Non-biomedical modes of treatment were suddenly imbued with the capacity to readjust citizen bodies to the social, economic, and environmental conditions of post-socialist life, increasingly defined as pathogenic. At first glance, there is something uniquely cosmopolitan to how ethnic and folk medical integration captured the institutional resources and the intellectual curiosity of medical professionals in Russia, and appeared uh, or appealed to a broad public engaged in the pursuit of healthcare. But it also is paradoxical, the popularization and increasing formalization of ethnically and culturally marked forms of care in Russia is unfolding amidst a return to robust forms of ethno-nationalism or state nationalism, right? Ethnic medical pluralism seemed to run counter to the kind of strong state model of put in Putin's Russia, a prog program often figured as a return to centralized power and top-down national homogenization. And that this has been a period marked by uh, xenophobia, the rejection of social justice claims for the links to Western values and agendas, and it is beset with fretting about the history of regional secessionism and minority separatism, at least in some circles. So the rise of an indeed ambiguous state embrace of culturally marked therapies that depart from conventional biomedical treatment and that tend to foreground historical and cultural differences stands at odds with other developments in the national uh, sphere, at least at first glance. When I conducted my ethnographic research, Buryatia found itself at the forefront of the state's budding enthusiasm for therapeutic plurality. Along with Buddhism, a local tradition of Tibetan medicine has been progressively revitalized in the Republic since 1989, promoted as a feature of the region's religious heritage, cultural identity, and unique therapeutic offerings. One way to resolve the paradox of the Russian state's ambivalent endorsement of traditional medicine is to read it cynically. Non-biomedical treatment is cheaper, especially when it comes to investing in medical infrastructures in remote regions. And this is no doubt part of the answer as to why Buryat medicine was receiving greater visibility. However, this misses what makes non-biomedical epistemologies of interest to Russia's central bureaucracies in the first place, as well as the role these practices play in regional politics and everyday patients' lives. One of the underlying arguments of the book is that Russian medical state building remains tied to its socialist past. And Soviet medicine, and Soviet modernity more broadly, was riddled with tension as it tried to articulate itself on a new historical path of development. It defined itself simultaneously against the diverse therapeutic traditions of the indigenous people that it tried to incorporate into the Soviet project, while also seeking to distinguish itself from Western bourgeois medicine. As the Russian state seeks to reimagine a new future for itself, away from the West, but also from its socialist past, it appears to have returned to and again become ensconced in the tangents of medical quote-unquote integration, attracted to Buryat and other traditional, uh, traditions as a way to express a uniquely inclusive post-socialist future that foregrounds the cultural and ethnic diversity of the country, but nonetheless insists on a fully unified, uniform Russia. That said, the book is not exclusively focused on the contradictory goals and ideologies of the Russian state's efforts to frame itself as a place apart from others. At a moment when a fully cohesive vision of the future modern medical state has yet to cohere in Moscow, my goal with this book was to re-theorize how people inhabit and make use of therapeutic margins, broadly conceived, while rethinking anthropology's discussions of encounters between biomedicine and traditional healing. Anthropology has a long tradition of engaging with therapeutic diversity. Arguably, it is one of the foundational pillars of the discipline. 
But as, bi as biomedicine became increasingly global, many of our explanatory models have shifted towards tracking the workings of global health, along with people's active rejections or pursuits of biomedical care. The effect is to posit biomedicine as the unquestioned center of gravity in people's therapeutic lives. In Russia, as elsewhere, both scholar scholarly and popular writers suggest that patients pursue traditional medicine in one of two cases, either because conventional care has failed them or because it is part of pre-existing cultural identification. Conversely, when framed in the language of non-compliance, as with the avoidance of vaccinations, therapeutic paths that shirk conventional care tend to in be interpreted as misguided in subordination to public health recommendation. the recommendations. In mixing medicines, I try to complicate these implicit centrifugal models that describe the relationship between, quote, official and, unquote, unofficial medicines. I appreciate anthropology's attention to the epistemic violence that often characterizes the frictions between globally circulating biomedical regimes and local therapeutic practices, as well as the discipline's careful excavation of how such frictions reenact colonial legacies. However, one empirical finding of my research is that in Russia, such, as an, such an approach overestimates the authority of biomedicine and reifies what counts as biomedicine in the first place. Furthermore, equating the tail end of exhausted medical options with forms of care described as, quote, traditional, risks playing into the long history of the Soviet and post-Soviet states' efforts to often violently modernize its ethnic minorities. It simply leaves little room for thinking about the pursuits of non-biomedical treatment positively, propelled by more than discontent, political resistance, or consumer appetites, but rather as a movement towards something else. Mixing medicines tracks how, in Russia, encounters between state-endorsed medicine and indigenous therapeutic traditions end up reshaping, uh, reshaping official models of care. The book pivots around two sets of conjoined arguments. First, I argue that Tibetan medicine and other medical traditions in Buryatia are deployed for fashioning an alternative therapeutic imaginary, one in which Siberia becomes both a center and a cosmopolitan crossroads by challenging, challenging the spatial orderings implicit in the Moscow fixated Russian state. Second, the book shows that rather than a last resort response to abandonment and social marginalization, Experiments with medical integration in Buryatia reflect local people's articulations of new kinds of human and non-human relations. Medical integration is not just about patching holes within biomedicine in the sense, but a way of fashioning new possibilities for, through newfangled relations with plants, spirits, landscapes, memories, and forgotten cultural meanings. But it also is a terrain of contestation. In Buryatia, experiments with integrative approaches to medicine reframe all ways of being and knowing as always coming from somewhere, and thus strive to put them on equal footing. They also invite us to think about how making something cohere is an arduous and uncertain process. By claiming Tibetan medicine as inalienably Buryat, yet key to restoring the health of Russia's body politic, local actors refashion the state's forays into therapeutic pluralism to articulate the region's central place in space and history and renegotiate the terms through which disparate therapies are assembled and held in place. In the remainder of this talk, I want to focus on several vignettes that might help illustrate some of the dynamics I seek to outline in the book. I'll begin with a question that haunted my research because it serves to situate the po uh, po politics that underpin the frictions and sutures of the project of medical integration in Buryatia. Where does mo so the question was this, where does modern medicine come from? It, the question was first posed to me by Sergei, one of the radiophysicists who worked on developing, uh, developing an electronic pulsometer based on Tibetan pulse diagnosis, a project initiated in the Buryat, a Buryat Sciences Center in 1980s and carried out to this day. Sergei and I sat <clears throat> on a bench outside the university building where he worked, and as I attempted to interview him about the goals of his research and about his participation in the project of integrating Tibetan medicine into clinical and laboratory practice, he matched every question I posed with his own. The inter inter interaction was quite awkward. Turning the questions back to, uh, on me, Sergei demanded an exegesis on the history of medical science. His provocation, which I first mistook for the physicist pension for a Socratic method of communication or for skepticism about a US-based researcher's intellectual credentials, slowly came to reframe my own questions. Sergei's answer was unique to him. At my fumbling response, he traced the genealogy of what he called scientific medicine to 19th century European military expansion, the discovery of the anesthetic properties of chloroform, and the development of field surgery. Tellingly, though, his question was not unique. 
As I sought to grasp what my interlocutors in Buryatia thought of the Russian state's efforts to formalize the region's therapeutic traditions, I was repeatedly asked in turn what I meant when I invoked biomedicine. Now, the term integratse, a Russian calc of integration, was a popular shorthand to describe what a number of medical institutions and proponents in the healthcare administration and professional medical communities were attempting to achieve. As I discussed elsewhere in the book, it figured prominently in the discourses and goals of a relatively recent medical field labeled restorative medicine that aims to, quote, restore the health of the nation through non-invasive natural medical technologies. In Buryatia and in Russia more broadly, Integratsa maps, maps onto lo long-standing but fraught national discourses about the countries and recursively the region's cultural uniqueness as a place of transition and translation between the cultures and histories of, quote, East and West. Here out, I outline the ways in which post-socialist politics of medical knowledge in Siberia might illuminate the dynamics of tradition in global discourses on traditional medicine in its relationship to biomedical practices. By paying attention to the semiotic interplay between modern and traditional medicine in Russia, I would like to take Sergei's challenge seriously. Certainly, critical histories of medicine and science more generally show the internal plurality of biomedical knowledge and practices, tracking their conceptual transformation, dead ends, and internal polyvalence frequently forgotten in a posteriori narratives on, of unidirectional scientific progress. For biomedicine to be recognized, uh, recognizably operating at a global scale, albeit as anthropologists have often noted, with different local actualizations and entanglements, as well as teeming with translational innovations springing from the interstices of therapeutic encounters, it must constantly map the particularities and origins, uh, origin points of its practices. So Sergei's question pushes these classic anthropological and science and technology studies insights that biomedicine too is multiple in a slightly different analytical direction. It seems to suggest that while all of its varied yet recognizable incarnations retain a connection to a stable form, apprehensions of its many avatars as always manifesting a recognizable totality, however fractured, allows us to speak to therapeutic practices that fall outside of biomedicine's realm as if such lines of distinctions were something one would be able to identify without much discussion. In contexts where tra uh, tracing boundaries between different kinds of medicines is never divorced from questions of how things travel and how they are made to settle, descriptions of therapeutic encounters between biomedicine and non-biomedical modalities tend to imply, for the sake of drawing the analytical contrast, a consensus about what biomedicine is. And it was this consensus Sergei was reestablishing a new, fraught, and what to me felt like socially antagonistic grounds. Not so much that there was a biomedicine, but that we could agree, or at least agree not to argue, about what we thought it was. It is in this sense that the term, quote, official, official medicine as a local gloss for biomedicine in Russia seems especially productive. In Russian, at least, official uh, means that, I'm oh, sorry, official offers more than unquestioned recognition. It implies a kind of double speak that brings into the frame its constitutive, outs constitutive outside. Accounts of Soviet science and medicine are sometimes haunted by Cold War legacies. So in excavating the uniqueness of Soviet knowledge projects, broadly speaking, it becomes remarkably difficult not to dissenter their authority or claims to truth by invoking Soviet political ideologies and institutional configurations as, deter as a determining factor for the ways in which they came to be. Conversely, conflations between, on the one hand, a history of Soviet and Russian therapeutic practices and ideologies, and on the other, of Western, European, North American approaches to both biomedicine and traditional medicine, miss the subtle and note the subtle distinctions. So if following Latour, purification is always an important, although never perfectly realized process through which modern scientific knowledge is co-constituted vis-a-vis those, vis -vis those practices it excludes, then what happens when an acknowledged hybridity stands at the crux of what it means to achieve medical and scientific progress? These dynamics in Russia displace the expected locus of tension between a global circulating authoritative biomedical discourse and local understandings of bodies and health. 
In fact, the oppositions between global and local, as well as between traditional medicine and biomedicine, become analytically limiting in the therapeutic context, where the questions of scale, points of origins, and the nature of medical efficacy and, uh, and adequate care are constantly worried and interrogated. Other scholars have noted that Soviet notions of progress had silenced a variety of actors in the name of modernist project of rapid, of rapid technological and social development founded on scientific rationality, a project, project moreover that was understood as simultaneously universal yet uniquely manifested. For its part, oh, yeah, that's fine. For its part, as I outline in the book, Soviet engagement with what was labeled Eastern medicine in general and Tibetan medicine in particular were integral to claims about what it means to practice medicine as a scientific discipline and offered a contrast set on which articulating a programmatic relationship between medicine and the modern state became possible. So if, as historian Susan Buckmores has suggested, the Soviet's project aspiration to its own version of cosmopolitan universalism was centered on intervening, um, sorry, um, on, uh, yeah, on intervening in di the dialectical unfolding of time, then leaving the medicines of the past in the past in the hands of appropriate experts, such as historians and ethnographers, offered a way to adjust the Soviet Union to a vision of medicine's universal yet explicitly European history. So the resurgence of one silence mode of healing as audible, tractable, and manageable agents under late socialism and in post-socialist moment is, a, is as much a reconfiguration of political histories as a ground on which Soviet ideologies of health were being remapped and reconfigured in the present. But we might ask, along with Sergei, uh, whose universal and whose particulars are being reconfigured in these moments. So the ethnographic vignettes or moments that follow look at the ways in which the relationship between modern and traditional medicine is formulated at different sites that bring these complex and contradictory stakes to the surface. Like crossbreeding a hedgehog with an adder. The officer Bayar Badmaevich was located on the second floor of the East-West Polyclinic, one of the four offices where practitioners who identify their specialty with Tibetan medicine resided. Inside, it would look like any biomedical space with its large desk and patient couch, its white curtains and hygienic paraphernalia, if not for the large Buddhist tanka reproduction of Yutokpa the Younger, an important spiritual figure of worship in the more esoteric aspect of Tibetan medical practice. Bayer Badmaevich himself wore the wh white frock typical of Russia's biomedical doctors, as did all the other members of the medical personnel at the center. The obligatory white gown worn by practitioners and the blue plastic slippers that patients were asked to don over their shoes upon entering the vestibule signaled the center's clinical biomedical identity. Bayer Badmaevich's patients, frequently older Buryat women, waited for their turn. They came one after another, sometimes accomp accompanied by a family member, sometimes asking for medical advice, not just for themselves, but for their neighbors and friends. He examined the pulse in silence, his gaze turned away from the patients and towards the window, feeling for the textures of pulsations first on one hand and then the other, then examined the patient's tongue. He asked no questions. The patient volunteered the information herself, painstakingly listing an array of diffuse symptoms, aches, pains, and wheezes, betraying an assiduous scrutiny of her interiority. He joked, diffusing the gravity of the patient's narrative, each manifestation of the body is already a potential sign of life-threatening failure, and recast it in the terms so typical of Tibetan medicine, of a body in constant flux. Quote, your wind has gone up again and it's making your phlegm come out of balance. I'll give you something to warm you up, to calm the wind and the phlegm should settle. Aside from the immediate clinical encounter with the patient happening behind closed doors, Tibetan medicine made few appearances in Bayar Madhumayevich's practice, despite the fact that this was indeed the specialty for which he was best known. For most practitioners of Tibetan medicine who worked at East-West, this was one of the difficulties of practicing Tibetan medicine in a state-sanctioned integrative clinical setting. To understand the nature of this, uh, this precarity, uh, it helps you illustrate some of the legislative conundrums which, uh, in, that frame Tibetan medicine and other forms of traditional healing in Russia, and which echo what Lambert and Muharji have termed subaltern therapeutics, the modalities of care that fall outside of what is deemed by the state as recognizably medicinal. Tibetan medicine's illegality in Russia, in the sense of being aside rather than outside the law, has to do with the terminological inconsistencies of Article 50 of Russia's Health Protection Codex. The confusion stems from a kind of artifactual amalgamation of the regulatory framework, 
older iterations of Article 50 in charge of regulating medical activity drew a distinction between med med traditional medicine and folk medicine, in part in an effort to comply with the WHO resolution on traditional medicines as a matter of indigenous sovereignty, and in part in the hopes of getting a handle on a distinctly post-socialist therapeutic multiplication. For its part, conventional usage in Russia's medical field differentiates between ethnically marked folk medicine, like say Bashkir herbalism or Buryat bone setting, and traditional medicine, which usually refers to, um, to procedures and pharmaceuticals derived from different traditions of folk medicine, but registered as isolated techniques incorporated into the system of official medical accreditation and training. So different types of ethnic herbalism are all lumped together into clinical phytotherapy. All forms of manual therapy are reclassified as therapeutic massage and so forth. In practice, this means that any given doctor can employ any given traditional medical technique for which they are accredited, even though since 2012, the category of traditional medicine as such was struck out of Article 50, leaving only quote unquote folk medicine as the sole legal signifier of medical alternatives to biomedical treatment. On the other hand, the license to practice folk healing or tselitelstva without reference to biomedical methodologies is issued under an entirely separate system of accreditation altogether, namely Russian labor law, which draws a categorical distinction between folk healing and medical practice, such that folk, heal folk healing falls into the miscellaneous catch-all category of small business ventures along dog alongside dog walking, genealogical survey, and escort services. After the federal level administrative body that used to license folk healers was dismantled in the early aughts, the task of licensing folk healing was outsourced to regional governments and at this time no unified licensing, licensing system exists. In other words, folk medicine is officially recognized as labor but not medicine, while traditional medicine is grandfathered into being recognized as medicine, but not labor on its own terms. So where does that leave practitioners of Tibetan medicine? Well, since the East-West Medical Center operated under the administrative supervision of Buryatia's Ministry of Health, all diagnoses had to be recorded in administratively legible language. In the center's report to the Regional Ministry of Health Protection, patients' conditions were formulated in the generic repertoire of biomedicine, and available treatments were almost exclusively reported in accordance with the categories of Russia's healthcare legislation. As a result, Tibetan medicine was reclassified as phytotherapy, among other things, and in fact parsed into these different kinds of um, atomized th uh, therapeutic techniques. Meanwhile, the specificity of Tibetan medicine with its particular approach to illness and the making of medicines was curiously invisible, despite the fact that by reading between the lines of the center's official reports, it became clear that practitioners of Tibetan medicine taken together were responsible for the biggest part of the center's revenue and tre treated the highest number of patients. So for doctors led by Yarbad Maevich, the administrative and legal invisibility of their specialty was a source of irritation. He often expressed annoyance at the necessity to identify himself as a phytotherapist, the closest, closest official gloss for Tibetan medicine practices, based on the fact that he relied on the prescription of botanical formulas in his treatments. As he explained, quote, the theories are completely different. Phytotherapy is really Western medicine. So for his part, Bayar Badmayevich argued that the East-West Medical Center as a medical site ought to emphasize traditional medicine over European medicine or biomedicine. The center as an administration, however, had a different vision of its institutional role. For the center's head doctor, administrative legibility was crucial to the center's continued existence as a legal medical entity, specifically as a state medical institution. As such, she saw it as uh, she saw the center as a medical project where integrative approaches that offered a combination of regular and good quality European medicine and quote techniques of traditional medicine were put to the service of rehabilitative and restorative medical practice. At the same time, the center itself offered what everybody in my among my interlocutors referred to as a kind of cover or krisha, which protected the uh, practitioners of Tibetan medicine for potential uh, uh, or allowed them to fly under sort of um, the state's legislative radar. 
So when I asked Bayar Badmayevich how he envisioned this fusion of traditional European medicine and kind of misalignment of the regulation uh, regulatory framework that enframed them, um, um, sort of in the in these optics of integration, he laughed. It, it is quote it is like trying to cross breed, breed a hedgehog with an adder. You get something unseemly. The English translation does not do justice to the original pithiness of the comment. In Russian, ush, adder, and yosh, hedgehog, sound remarkably similar until they are forcibly combined. So the problem, according to Bayar Badmayevich, was, was that such forced conjugations multiplied in coherent therapeutic hybrids, in coherent bo both in the sense of epistemology and also at the level of treatment, such that treatment and the, or, or, or their results or sort of the, their outcomes was never entirely certain for anyone involved. Um, so doctors and staff used a shorthand to classify traditional therapeutic modalities um, practiced at the center in terms of their relative easternness and westernness to sort of organize this uh, prolifer hybrid proliferation. In other words, although the legislative, legislative distinction remains along the lines of modern and traditional medicine, in practice, there are separate gradients of differentiation along which therapeutic approaches might be categorized. So, for example, both phytotherapy and homeopathy might be traditional, but they are posited explicitly as Western knowledge systems, informed by the logics that, from the point of view of Tibetan medicine, share a fundamental kinship with Western biomedicine. Even acupuncture then becomes divided into its Western and Eastern interpretation. Similarly, the pharmacological principles of Tibetan medicine rely on the ability of plant-derived medicinal substances to affect uh, the three constitutions and practitioners combine the materia medica in such ways as to regulate what's called niepa in tr or traditional uh, sort of uh, in, in, in translated into Russian as the culprits behind or, or the roots of the illness of illnesses. Whereas traditional Russian or Western phytotherapy is based on composing botanical mixtures in such a way that each ingredient is matched to a specific condition or physiological system, such as the digestive tract, the cardiovascular system, or the nervous system. So it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's based Western phytotherapy, accord, according to um, the Tibetan medicine practitioners I spoke to, are based on a kind of active ingredient um, organ um, or dis uh, disorder within a specific organ, cor organ correspondence. This approach within Russian phyto phytotherapy allowed practitioners of Tibetan medicine to identify it as quintessentially belonging to biomedical practices, despite its official classification as traditional, on the pr principle that biomedicine was based on a symptom active ingredient pairing. According to a logic of root causes, focusing primarily on both symptoms and bodily systems elides the underlying working of the nyepa or culprits and the ways in which different organs are made to relate and influence each other. The most typical example I heard of this apparent short-sightedness attributed to modern medicine is the treatment of ear disorders by acting only on the ear itself without checking on the kidneys, which in Tibetan medicine have a di direct connection to hearing. So in other words, while both Tibetan medicine experts and phytotherapists use botanical substances, practitioners of Tibetan medicine critique phytotherapy's focus on symptoms and its failure to address the root cause of the illness, much in the same way that they critique biomedicine. But at the same time, they are only allowed to practice within this kind of regulated uh, clinical spaces as le legibly phytotherapists. Everything else must be sort of happening under the radar. And uh, the, the, this proliferation of different modalities of care um, is essentially ends up um, operating within this realm of deep therapeutic um, contingency and uncertainty for all the practitioners involved. And so, and also finally, at the most practical level, this proliferation of hybrids meant that a large part of um, the, the labor that traditional uh, Tibetan medicine medical practitioners undertake, for example, the really arduous work of preparing medicines from, from the ground up, was both invisible and from an administrative standpoint, entirely unrecognizable, even if the clinic and treatment plans depended on it. Okay, so that's the situation in the kind of integrative, um, integrative clinic. 
Um, and in the in this following section, last, sec, last section, I'll shift to a different sort of critique. Um, and it's an external critique of the institutionalization of MT medicine in Buryatia, formulated by those practitioners who find themselves at the peripheries of the official, official medical estab establishment. In my conversations with Erdan Lama, an MT working in one of the local Buddhist temples, I asked him how ideas about illness and health in European medicine differed from those in MT medicine. And he replied, as many of my uh, MT uh, interlocutors did, or MT being traditional medicine practitioners, that Western medicine lacked a theory because it was simply incapable of getting to the root cause of illness. Unlike European medicine, he explained, Buddhist medicine understood that all illnesses had, if reduced to their phenomenological foundations, a single root cause, namely ignorance, or nivedinya in Russia. Confused by whether he meant ignorance in a more secular sense, or whether he was offering a felicitously homo a homophonic Russian gloss of the Sanskrit avidya, or delusion, an important Buddhist concept, I asked him to explain. After a period of mildly irritated reflection at my obtuseness, Erdan Lama finally volunteered the following example, quote, if a person doesn't know how to live, they get sick, which is why we have to begin with enlightening our consciousness and only then move on to the body. Think about it. Conventional medicine claims that one must, quote, temper, zakalyavat, the body, dress according, dress according to the weather, take contrasting showers, it's all, and it's all wrong, erroneous, mistaken. This is why it's always a failure when they try to study our medicine from the scientific point of view. We always present European medicine as anti-scientific. Why? Because how did they even think this up, that you should temper the body? We're not made of steel that we need tempering. In this response, Erdin Lama cleverly combined a Buddhist critique of European forms of medical knowledge, invoking the failures to cure illness and the recalcitrant chronic cases that frequently result in patients in Russia falling through the cracks of official healthcare, with a rejection of a specific health practice and ideology particular to both official Russian and Soviet medicine, namely zakalivanya or tempering. In order to understand this really strange equation, equation by all accounts, Zakalivanya is certainly not at the center of the practices of mainstream biomedicine in Russia, it is useful to briefly consider its history and positions in present-day present discourses on health. According to the great Soviet encyclopedia, Zakal, Zakalivanya is defined as a, quote, system of procedures that contribute to the organism's capacity to resist the nefarious effects of the external milieu through the production of conditioned reflexes of thermal regulation with the purpose of its improvement. A surface reading of tempering suggests a model of the human body as a relatively malleable substance that can be strengthened and qualitatively transformed through a specific set of bodily techniques, namely exposures to the environment. Tempering was a widespread form of bodily self-management that gained popularity in the Soviet Union and is still sometimes invoked by you know, people to this day as part of a part and parcel of quotidian practices associated with healthy living, or at least is formulated as an ideal of healthy living towards which one might strive. In discourses on tempering, it is especially the child's body that it becomes the focal point of regulatory interventions as advocates of the practice emphasize the need to activate the latent capacity of the infant and of the human as a life more uh, broadly to withstand the harsh environment, the capacity progressively lost over time through excessive efforts to maximize, uh, maximally optimize external condition. The logic of Zakalimania has actually a long and complex history in Russia and is not unproblematically tethered to exclusively Soviet bodily ideologies, although it does resonate with other Soviet scientific practices that strove to develop a philosophy of human health. As a concept, tempering also moves beyond the manipulation of strictly human bodies to encompass other living organisms, such as plants. For his part, though, Erdan Lama grounded tempering in the history of the Soviet state shifting health ideologies. In his own medical practice, he related Russia's more dis uh, much discussed demographic crisis to what he described as an epidemic of infertility among young women caused, in his opinion, by the logics and practices of environmental independence. And while Russian biomedicine had a long and robust tradition of thinking about environmental aspects of health, Erdan Lama's critique runs deeper than the simple rejection of a somewhat cliched Soviet medical utopia about impervious bodies operating at the margins of the possible. <laughs> 
I take his equa equation between what he calls European, read Soviet medicine and tempering, as an effort to articulate a theoretical level abstraction about biomedical knowledge practices in general. Like many other traditional healers in Buryatia, Erdan Lama was engaged in a politics of weirding biomedicine by localizing it. In Sovietizing what he called European medicine through an invocation of tempering, Erdan Lama's critique rejects claims to universal human bodies or a single universal way of managing them. Localizing bodies was a recurrent concern in many conversations I had with practitioners of Amchi medicine, as well as scientists who did research on the topic. Tibetan medicine in Buryatia was thought to have adapted to the environmental and cultural conditions of its relocation to Siberia. Practitioners often suggested that the Buryat version of Amchi medicine differed subtly from its other expressions in Nepal, China, and India and Mongolia. For example, Dr. Zhapovich, a well-known local practitioner, a practitioner, explained that a history of working with European bodies had left its mark. Because Russian bodies tended toward more phlegm, while Buryat bodies exhibited an excess of bile, its medicinal formulas were adapted accordingly, he claimed. Articulating a similar attention to emplaced bodily becoming, Erdan Lama explained that even though there used to be profound differences between indigenous Buryats and Russian settlers, with time, ethnic distinction became skin deep, progressively collapsing through processes of cohabitation, cultural hybridization, and the exercise of Soviet state power. So like other Amchi, Erdan Lama addresses biological life as always already an emplaced local affair, one that cannot be abstracted from the environmental, cultural, and historical conditions that form it. The increased flemminess of European bodies, the tendencies of local Buryat bodies to accumulate heat, accumulate heat by way of bile, the infertility of modern young women became indices of the medical histories of Soviet and post-socialist life. Implicit in these claims, is the sense that the failure of state medicine in Russia from the Amchi's perspective and, its, and the failure of its attempts at integration lies in its curious double blindness. State-backed ideologies of health simultaneously produce local forms of embodiment and subsequently mistake them for the universal abstract body of biomedical science, while obscuring the ideological imaginaries and pragmatic conditions that make these embodiments possible in particular. So in other words, and this is just sort of my concluding remarks, and I'm happy to open for questions, um, Chi and Buryatia, both those who are, find themselves outside of the official medical infrastructure, or, and those who find themselves practicing in the interstices um, of, the, of the sort of pos, or, or of the regulatory frim, framework, frequently emphasize the stark differences between traditional modern medicine, but also contested the boundaries of distinctions articulated through an op opposition between in something like traditional, modern, East and West, etc. One of the implications of these oppositions and refusals is that traditional Tibetan medicine that is nonetheless specific to Buryatia can be mobilized in a politics of pat patrimony the Russian state might have access to only by virtue of a serious engagement with Buryatia's culturally, religious, historical and ethnic specificity. This unique regional configuration is formulated as inherently more syncretic and more global by virtue of Buryatia's culturally equidistant ties to multiple symbolic religious and therapeutic worlds. Conversely, official medicine, or biomedicine itself, insofar as it is linked to European medicine, becomes open to critical localization and a challenge to its, uh, and a challenge to its universalist claims. So when Amchi like Erdan Lama or Bayar Badmayevich or, or physicists like Sergei, um, uh, you know, um, challenge sort of the, you know, the US-based um, US ethnographer about my medical historiographies or um, seek to specify what is meant by biomedicine um, as opposed to kind of the, its, its constitutive outside. It is precisely because a quote, official medical a medicine that mistakes itself for human universal is blind to its own rootedness and to its trajectories of travel and blind to the very processes that have officiated it. And thus offers no adequate terrain on which integration on either medical or political grounds might be imagined as desirable. Okay, and that's, um, that's what I have. So I'm happy to, um, to take questions. Let me stop my share. Thank you so much, Tatiana. This was so uh, interesting.
I just wanted to remind our um, audience to please pose your questions to either the Q&A box if you are uh, watching or listening to this talk uh, on Zoom. And if you are tuning in through uh, YouTube, you can type your questions in the chat uh, and um, I will post those questions to our speaker. And um, I am uh, going to take the advantage of my moderator uh, role and I'm gonna pose my first question and um, so one of the questions that I think our series is trying to answer is the question of how, um, how do global, um, sorry, how do uh, global geopolit uh, and domestic geopolitics and biopolitics manifest uh, in daily practices of care? And so you've discussed uh, um, this in itself as a giant uh, question, but I also want to ask kind of here to, you, you discussed very well the distinction between Western, Soviet, um, modern, traditional, but how is it Russian? How is it Russian? And uh, how this kind of practice has been exported and when it has been exported or mobilized outside of its kind of practice in, in Buryatia? Specifically for Tibetan medicine or, um, yeah. So, no, I think that's a great question. I think that, um, the kind of the global, the way that the global aspect of it comes into play is that um, under Russia, so, so there's a couple of ways in which traditional medicine can become, or traditional form medical modalities can become or have been um, sort of officiated, right, as part of um, um, national healthcare. And so a lot of my interlocutors we're looking at uh, Mongolia, at definitely at China, right, for a model of how a traditional medicine can be nationalized. That being said, they were also extremely aware of the fact that um, this avenue is close to them uh, in Russia for a couple of different reasons. Partly because there is, you know, you you can't there is no such thing and this is sort of um what the politics of a lot of these debates that i'm sketching out in the stock are there's no such thing as an explicit russian traditional medicine right you can have all this different and of course you know and and then you have the sort of added product of, uh you know, problem that you know, uh, multinational kind of constitution, uh, one's uh, Russia's multinational constitution is like literally ratified into into the constitution, right? That there's not a single, this is not a, um, a, a sort of single um, uh, majority um, optics, which means that um, you can't go, you know, at least again, my, my interlocutors who were interested in some kind of formalization did not um, envision the future of Tibetan medicine in Russia or in Buryatia as modeling on that um, kind of TCM, right? TCM or Ayurveda model. So something else had to be, um, you know, it, it had to take a different form. And the, the form that it took is this, is this, is this sort of frame and framement of integration, which proliferated um, all kinds of anxieties around care and specifically both care in terms of sort of the um, the labor politics of practicing medicine right and care in the sense of um, the potential outcomes for patients once um, these different very quite different therapeutic logics were um, conjugated together in a clinical space, right? Um, with quite a few conflicts, which I don't touch on, but I'm happy to talk about it, quite a few, uh, quite a few conflicts about how does one in fact treat a complex, you know, a, a patient with a cr complex chronic conditions and what might be the outcomes if one is sort of combining all these different therapies when you know that the epistemologies of these therapies, right? And the descriptions of, of disease, et cetera, just don't match. Right, they're just they're, they're just coming together, kind of inside the body of the patient, as it were. So, um, so that was kind of one way in which this the, the global um, kind of, to answer your question, one way in which this global question came in, right? So, kind of like how do we do it, considering that we can't do it this way, right? The other aspect of it um, has to do with a kind of you know a biopiracy story, 
that um, you know around the production of um, uh, Tibetan medicine or Buryat medicine, um, sort of um, plant-based uh, pharmaceutical assemblages, and the fact that um, we are seeing kind of two movements. One movement is of plants going mostly towards China, right? Regional endemics going mostly towards China, and another movement which was which was happening a little earlier in the in the nineties where some of the formularies um, and were translated and incorporated into Western, um, so Western European um, sort of supplement, um, biological supplement pharmacopoeias, right? And which brings up this question of intellectual property and um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but as it stands, right, like, the, like sort of the Tibetan medicine as it is practiced in Buryatia, depending on which site you sort of find yourself, a temple, a clinic, or whatever it might be, um, the circulate, I wouldn't say that its circulation is global, right? But but its atomization certainly points to global connections, right? Or its disassemblies. Thank you for the questions, great one. Thank you. I also, I'm very curious about, um, speaking about who are the carriers of this uh, tradition or this knowledge and what is um, how who are the healers how the, their authority is established and what kind of apparatus or uh, exists there is it centralized or is it very kind of sporadic so i just wanted to hear more about yeah, that aspect. Yeah. it's very sporadic and it is different so you have a couple of possible kind of avenues for how you might be able to um, start practicing Tibetan medicine. And, but, but in Buryatia, it was for a long time, it's a, there's a, the book goes into this quite, you know, um, it's a kind of historical chapter unpacks this, these, these histories, but um, it was a lineage system uh, where one would train right with a with a particular healer or a group of um, you know a group might train with a particular healer um, and then they would they might have um, um, you know th those disciples might then have their disciples etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, it was it underwent a certain degree of institutionalization which in the Buddhist temples of the region, which, which came to a crashing halt, of course, in the, in, in the 1930s when those temples were dismantled. Um, and then it sort of went underground, uh, Tibet medicine sort of went underground. And the place where most of its um, kind of um, where it's, you know, it, it, it was certainly, I mean, it was certainly present and you had, you know, you have people telling stories about um, somebody, you know, somebody in their family who was kind of practicing under the radar in a small village and, you know, the state didn't care too much, the Soviet state didn't care too much and the local, you know, state officials were using, were going to that healer anyway and they weren't going to, you know, to, um, to do anything about it. But in terms of kind of the institutional its institutional survival, it was in the scientific community, local scientific community. Um, and so that is another kind of trajectory through which when we come to the 90s and really kind of the late 80s, um, we're suddenly seeing um, people who are um, beginning to practice it again, right, as, as doctors, right? But right now it's sort of, the, the, the localizations are kind of, um, so, so where one finds Tibetan medicine practitioners, it varies quite a lot in their trajectories, the kind of epistemic trajectories of the, this practitioners vary quite a lot as well. But a kind of a broad brush strokes is the, you know, it's kind of private clinics, um, state clinics are, uh, you know, their presence in, the, in a kind of state endorsed clinic is, um, is a rare case. It's either private clinics or, um, well, East, what I call East West. Uh, and then um, the uh, certainly temples and then a kind of like network of private practitioners that are unmarked, right? So what we'd call say in Russian Chasnikia, right? Kind of in the, in, the, in the urban and rural landscape. So that's sort of, you know, and, and, and those positionalities vary, right? So, and, and these people don't necessarily get always get along or agree on what Tibetan medicine is. Does that help answer it? Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. We have um, we have a question from uh, Alexa Lehorsky. I'm so sorry if I butchered your last name. Um, and so I feel like we um, uh, Tatiana already discussed the first uh, part of the question about. Um, so Alexa asks for practitioners uh, practitioners of traditional uh, folk Tibetan medicine healing. It seems that working within the state's medical uh, framework is exceptionally challenging. Are, uh, are there practitioners working outside of state medical centers? And I, uh, would it even be possible or permitted? I um, and what might encourage or discourage them from operated care, uh, operating care centers independent of the state? So I feel like this was already discussed, but then there is another question. What is the advantage for these practitioners to operate within the state framework? And is it legitimacy? Is it for legitimacy or any uh, something else or any other factors? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, it's literally talked about in terms of like, I don't know if you know the Russian term, but Krisha, which kind of is a term that comes out of, you know, 1990s kind of criminal, um, you know, um, organizations, right, that uh, might provide protection, right, uh, kind of like the protection racket uh, model of things, right, protection against um, potential um, kind of encroachments or, or um, or retributions. So, you know, and everybody, of course, jokes about using that term <laughs> for this, but that's kind of how it's talked about. So it is a kind of legal protection that comes with costs, right? For like, that comes with professional costs. One of the protection, uh, the, the, the professional, so, and, and those, you know, some of those co costs are very much clinical and I sort of touched upon them, right? That sense of uncertainty when you're treating a patient, right? You might know, right? A Tibetan medical practitioner might have a very clear sense of what's wrong with a patient, but that sense is not legible, um, right? It, it, it's not legible and it's not writable. <laughs> either, right, within the way that the legislation is organized right now, right? So it's, um, they have to constantly self-translate. Um, at the same time as patients really do want to have both the actual sort of Tibetan medicine expert um, treat them, right? That they're, they're coming there for specific kinds of therapies, specific kinds of pharmaceuticals, and they want, they don't necessarily want the biomedical diagnosis. Right. I mean, it, chances are they've already tried biomedicine and they're not all that keen on continuing <laughs> right? because it probably hasn't worked. So it provides a legislative protection in a sense, even though it generates these kinds of epistemic and clinical contingencies. Right. On, uh, you know, on the other hand, it really ties their hands right behind their back in a weird way for and, and it also outsources. So, so this is the drawback right? The advantage is rather thin. Uh, the drawback is that, you know, it outsources um, risk. So if, right, it, it, it outsources risk such that if something goes wrong in the treatment, um, that kind of calculus of who is responsible, right, is not super obvious to anybody involved. I mean, it's sort of, it's a kind of like this kind of double-edged protection almost. Um, uh, but but again, you know, it, it, it does give you a certain kind of legibility. And because a lot of those practitioners and they have both training, right? In order to practice in those spaces, most of the time, it's not always, but most of the time you need to have a medical license, right? So there is, so they're kind of like shifters, right? In kind of linguistic anthropology terms where they can index one or the other side of um, whatever their kind of clinical identity is. Um, but those clinical identities are not on even political terrains, right? Do not do not operate on even political terrains. So by the time I was sort of finishing up, wrapping up my field work in 2017, most, um, and this is sort of where the book goes, right? Most practitioners I was I had worked with for for many years were leaving the clinical space because it was not tenable, and a lot of them were trying to engage in some kind of activism about pushing through official legislation, but they were very pessimistic about, about the possibilities of this, right? Um, you know, and this is in a context, I mean, if we are to compare with some, a place like Moscow, everybody's just practicing in private clinics and it's not an issue. 
<laughs> right? But there is something about that conjugation between state, the state, and the sort of state's vision of um, kind of almost utopian, right, healthcare, and what's possible, in fact, right? That's that's very much producing quite a bit, bit of friction. Sorry, that was a long-winded way of answering your question. It's a great one. No, no, thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Cassandra Harbley. And uh, so the question is, uh, thank you for this talk. What, a, what an exciting project. I'm wondering if you could address a small point that uh, I was just a bit curious about. In the talk, you use the terms Western uh, uh, and Eastern, in quotes, uh, to contrast two types of orientations to medicine. Perhaps you said this and I missed this, but I'm curious if this is a distinction that your interlocutors themselves used or uh, if it is an analytic category from medical anthropology. Partly I'm curious because when I had the opportunity to visit Buratia, I was interested uh, in the complex layered way that some people I met described themselves both European and Burat. So I'm curious about the way you are complicating these binaries of traditional slash biomedical and Western slash Eastern uh, throughout this project. Thank you, Cassandra. It's an amazing question. It's really helpful. Yes, those are not my categories. So those are categories that my interlocutors were using and they were constantly using them very strategically, right? Um, there is this sort of wonderful epistemological model around, uh, and, and, and I came in, of course, with that model too, right? Around like, what do we, what are the terms of distinction, right? Um, there is a, um, I, I, I ran out of time, but yes, so, so Western and, and, and Western and Eastern doesn't necessarily map onto um, Western and Eastern within as, as modifiers for medicine weren't necessarily always mapping into a geopolitical, uh, they, they can be mapped and they sometimes are mapped onto a geopolitical kind of choreography and like Russian Russia's place, right? And, the, and Buratia's place in relation to these kinds of poles or axes or whatever, you know, call them, but not necessarily, right? And everybody was extremely well aware that all of these modifiers were slippery and, you know, in constant motion, right? So bio, what is biomedicine? Like, like, what do we call it? Academic medicine, biomedicine, Western medicine, you know? And so this was like a source of constant laughter when I was, <laughs> you know, was that when I was talking to my interlocutor, because like, we couldn't come up with a, with, like there is, it was the sense that there's a distinction, right? And those, those categories, matter at political, you know, at the political level, they're constantly being reiterated. But what's being claimed, right? So this was like such a central part of these conversations, this sh the, 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 the kind of the, the, the shifting nature of these categories. Um, but of course, they can be taken up to make certain kinds of claims, right? And I think the main refusal was, and, and maybe the kind of the the polarity between the, the Western and Eastern, right? Or the, as I understood it, the sort of main refusal was this idea that biomedicine was unmarked, right? So my, my interlocutors were constantly complicating this and saying, look, it's coming from a place. It is already packed with a certain kind of ideology. It doesn't have like, and insofar as the project is integration, right? Um, you know, on whose terms are we integrating this, right? That's kind of where the poly, what, where I was seeing a lot of the poly, epistemic politics of these, these questions. I ran out of time. I had another vignette where, which kind of like illustrates this in a really fun way, where um, during a um, kind of conference organizing at East West, there was a phone call. So I was, I was hanging out with the, in the office where, you know, with the folks who were organizing this conference. And so the center's lawyer takes this, you know, takes a phone call from Moscow. She's trying to keep a face, straight face, right? And not to laugh um, at whatever the, the, the Moscovite is saying. And then she hangs up um, the phone and, you know, everybody's like, what, what, what was so funny? And she says, um, oh, they asked me if what we were practicing is non-traditional medicine. <laughs> And so the entire, you know, the entire kind of room falls, you know, just starts laughing. And it's kind of the, that subtle, you know, she kind of does a kind of flirtatious head bob, et cetera, et cetera, just to kind of mark the ridiculousness of that distinction. And of course, that kind of encapsulates the politics, right? Because it is a politics of marketness and unmarkedness on whose term, non-traditional, right? Um, you know, on who who is the sort of articulator of these categories? And that's really kind of what is behind my use, you know, my, my constant kind of worrying in this talk of these of these 
binaries, right? I hope that answers it. Thank you. Um, I have another question, which is, what are the stakes of practicing and maintaining uh, this line of uh, medicine? And here I'm thinking uh, more locally for your interlocutors who are both practitioners and people who go and, and use um, and use this time, uh, type of um, um, medicine. And is it, is it indigeneity? Is it, uh, so besides just uh, healing itself and bodily and, or mental interventions, is it about indigeneity? Is, it, is there any kind of community related um, discourse? Is it about economic survival or any other kind of connections uh, that matter? So what, what are the stakes? I think they're layered. There's a lot of, and, and sort of like all of the above, <laughs> right? In a sense, right? But, but it really depends, right? And it, actually it's not, it's not without conflicts either because um, on the one hand you have a kind of regional identity slash brand, like which is about economic, solvency right Buryatia is I think that it's definitely like one of the dota uh, the, the, the one they dotation like kind of like you know a region that receives federal money right federal federal support and there is a lot of conversation around how you know how do we make uh things economically solvent and for a number of years now tourism has been very much foregrounded and you know, so it is seen as a kind of cultural resource that can be operationalized. And it is to, in, to many extent, because there certainly are people coming into Buryatia from other regions for receiving treatment, especially from Yakutia, that, the, you know, the sort of like Novosibirsk, those, the, that kind of the, that Siberian side of things, right? Um, less, and to some extent from Moscow, but kind of Moscow's gaze towards it is, is it, you know, I'm happy to talk about it, but it is, it is a little different. It's not necessarily a therapeutically interested one. It's, it's more an, an extractively interested one. Um, but I think it depends. So what is at stake? I think that regional, regional distinction, which does sometimes maps onto indigen kind of articulations of indigeneity, but sometimes doesn't. And I think Tibetan medicine is an interesting place where it doesn't go one-to-one -one because of, you know, some practitioners are Russian. It, it has more to do with Buddhism than it has to do with, I mean, it has to do with Buryatness, of course, Buryatness as well. But you know what I mean? Like it's, those distinctions are not necessarily um, like one-to-one -one relationships, but um, it does have to do with, uh, care, right? As you said, like sort of the clinical possibility or the therapeutic possibilities of um, what it means to address illnesses or chronic conditions, et cetera, that are especially fraught within the existing medical system, right? So it definitely has to do with that. It has to do with religious identities, has to do with sort of um, yeah, with, 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 with a sense of um, kind of making, you know, emplacement in a sense, including environment, right? So because a lot of the pharmaceutical production around Tibetan medicine is deeply regional, right? Deeply kind of situated within this particular local environment. Um, there, and, and yeah, and, and sort of there's a politics to that as well, of course, right? Um, it is in some sense about making place, right? Uh, both in place bodies and in place medicine. So it's kind of like, yeah, so it's kind of like all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these things to say, and, and it really depends on scale. It's kind of like, where do you end up looking, right? Like you, if you end up looking at this top level kind of like administrative stuff, you'll get one picture, then you can look at the, um, you know, the scientific production around it and the kind of, uh, and uh, you know, the, reg the production of certain kinds of linguistic registers around it. That's another thing, right? So, so you'll get these different stakes around this, um, this nexus, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, I think we are running out of time. Thank and you so much. This was, yeah, it was such a pleasure to talk to you all about this. And um, thank you for your lovely questions there. And, you know, I could, that helps me keep thinking about it, which is really great.
It is, I'm sure our audience uh, has so much to think about. And I again invite everyone to read your new book, Mixing Medicines, Ecologies of Care in Buddhist Siberia uh, from Fordham University Press. And, uh, uh, and thanks of course, everybody for joining. Uh, our next talk uh, will take place um, in about a month. Uh, on December 8th at noon Eastern time, uh, and I, uh, it will be a talk uh, by Dr. Anna Klepikova, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the European University at St. Petersburg. Uh, she's also the author of I Must Be a Fool, uh, a book published by European University Press in 2018. So the talk title, the title will be Residential Institutions for Disabled People in Russia, Two Models of Care. We hope you have a chance to join us for that next talk. And meanwhile, have a great day, everyone, and um, take care.